Door crusher prices and bargains every hour with $40,000 worth of giveaways. Special manufacturer's offers and deals, deals, deals. If you ski, want to ski, or even think you might ski, you'd better get to Sportive. But get there soon for the very best selection. It's the real ski sale held over till Monday only at Sportive. Only at 2674 West 4th. Get there. Good morning, a few months ago, a new star appeared on the Hollywood horizon, took over television. He made Henry Fonda and Richard Burton look sick. He came on with such panache, slick sophistication that you'll recognize him yourself from this little clip. Sure could use some of your class around home, Mickey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are you just visiting, mister? Call me Wayne. Everybody does. You know who it is, but now let's see him in his real profession, which is why his face is on the screen this morning. I think that one of the great things about our sport that it's opened so many doors for Wayne Gretzky and I have so many different directions that I can head and so many things that I can do um, without forgetting that hockey is the reason why I'm getting these chances. Sabres get it back. Patrick gave it away. Here's Gretzky. The great Gretzky, and it's unlikely he'll ever play for the Vancouver Canucks. But you can know all about him instantly this morning. First of all, from the Arbane Yule Brenner of the Vancouver province, Jim Taylor, here live and in living color. And with him, the co-author, or rather the author of the book on Gretzky, Walter Gretzky, Wayne's father. We're going to talk about hockey and Gretzky's this morning, and then later in the program we're going to have a sober mo moment. What are things coming to? When I've got an expert here this morning from New York who is making available to the schools in British Columbia a an anti-alcoholism program for kindergarten kids. And I'm not joking. But first, let's have some fun with Taylor and Gretzky after the break. Somebody had said that Wayne had, and all of a sudden, at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, he's got RCMP guys pounding on his door. <laughs> Doesn't know what the hell's going on. I know what's going on. Those were, those were, well, the mystery man around three Yeah, not that. Nothing's going on, he tells me. Nothing's well, coming back, isn't he? I, he will. He's got the instinct. And guys like Dr. Rowder keep putting up the money. Uh, Karen, three's got to go over there. Isn't it funny about Nelson though, Jack? The only blue chip sports event he really has. 30 seconds. I'm used to it. He's used to it. I'll start soft. I'll, I'll start soft. Oh, don't worry I'm about it. I'm basically a nice guy though. You ever seen me on television? Yes, yes I have. As we said on the line on the television, everybody's here but Wayne. But it is indeed a pleasure to meet Walter Gretzky, who is Wayne Gretzky's father. Now, I'm not going to be hard on you this morning because you've got all the money in the world, you and Wayne now, and you can, you know, if you don't like it, you can walk off the program. But just tell me one thing, Walter. Were you one of these horrible hockey parents that dragooned a poor little kid out at four in the morning when he was four years of age to run up and down and learn to skate? Well, if you listen to most people, yes, I was, but really I wasn't. And as far as four in the morning or five in the morning or six in the morning, that's not for me. He lives I have to survive. For God's sake, where it's, uh, you can do it at four in the afternoon. Can you stand up on skates? I try to, but well, not how, very well. How come the little boy got involved in skates, first of all? He was a star when he was five or six, and he was protected by the police when he was nine. You see, I've read the cover of the book, if nothing else. Well, you have to remember, if, you, if you're a Canadian, it's our national sport. Everybody likes to do that. Uh, and you can say, well, how's a kid five years old? know what he wants at that age, but it, there's a difference. Doing something and wanting to be something are two different things at the age of five. Yeah, but who put the skates on him at the age of two and a half? His mother. 
It's mother did. So she's to blame for all this wealth and fame and fortune. Not quite. The reason Phyllis put the skates on was that Walter was looking for his camera. Did I speak to you at the moment? Camera. Just the moment I'm speaking to Walter. That's a co-author, Jack. We do, it. we do it a double. Yeah, I see. Well, you carry on then. No, I, I was really saying, two and a half. When did he first have skates on? Actually, his birthday's in on uh, January 26th, and it was in the month of uh, January or late December when he first skated, so he's close to three. Close to three. <laughs> Just waited. Okay, you pick up the story from there. When did he first sign a million dollar contract? Never. <laughs> Never. That's the biggest <laughs> lie in the entire Gretzky thing. I'll tell you. Scalbenia told me. Well, you didn't Prosecution read the book. Prosecution rests. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> All right. Wayne Gretzky, right now, is not the highest paid player in the National Hockey League. He's not the second. He's not the third. I seriously doubt he's the fourth. I would say, and I don't know the exact figures, we've got all of Wayne's contracts in, but the last one. Mm -hmm. We've got every detail. I would guess that he would be making right now about $375,000, $380,000 a year, base, just for playing hockey, none of the other stuff. Marcel Dion makes six hundred and fifty. dollars You want to explain that to me? I'd be happy US. to listen. U.S. Yes. Well, explain it to me. That baffles me. One presume Marcel Dion's nothing compared to Gretzky. Well, he's a great hockey player, but it just it matters of when you sign the contract and what you... Uh, you know what you ask for and what you get and how long the contract is. Wayne's in a contract now till 1999, but there is a reopening clause. I think it is in 86 or 87. 87. I would love to be a fly on the wall for that one. I'll tell you. In other words, uh, he doesn't get an automatic increase every year between 80, between now and 86 and 87. Well, it's it's not. It, I think there's increases, yeah, there but are. not. Yeah. You know, at the end of it, he's not. In other words, when you say he's got a contract in 1999 or whatever, in fact, he's got a contract till 86 or 87. With Yeah, the, with six-year opening clauses in it. That, and then he starts again. He can walk away and make a new deal somewhere else. No, 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 no. He just, you're, you can renegotiate, but that doesn't mean if Peter Pockington said, no, that's a contract, you signed it, that's it, then he'd have to go with the one he's got. But nobody's going to be that dumb. Because why not? He would play just as well if he were only getting half a million dollars a year as if he were getting a million any and a half, wouldn't much, he? Any idea how much money Wayne could make if he went to Sweden? No, I have no <laughs> idea how much, how much money could Wayne make if he went to he Sweden. He could make a hell of a lot more than he makes in the National Hockey League. But would Wayne go to Sweden? Goodness, are you raising this horrible ghost of the <coughs> fact that Wayne is in this business not for the sport but for the money? Well, you're in for both of them. It is a livelihood. Uh, I think at this time, it's the only thing Wayne knows how to do and do well. Uh, one day he's going to have to do something else because you don't play hockey forever. There's only one Gordie Howe. Mm. By the way, before we start taking up a collection for Wayne, we must point out that that's hockey. You know, I mean, if you put everything else together, the Canon cameras and everything else, he's undoubtedly the highest paid in total player. Athlete. Athlete. I yes. mean, hockey athlete. Hockey athlete. More than a baseball player. Oh, I don't know. Maybe Dave Winfield makes more and some of those other guys because they, they get the, that weird U.S. money. You know, it's worth a dollar. Yeah, more than a National Football League player, for oh, yeah, sure. I would, I would think more than a lot of them. All right, now, give me some of the little dramatic influence uh, in incidents from his particular uh, career. I read a piece about him being mobbed by the police when he was nine. What was the state of his hockey then when he was nine? And why was he, why was he protected by the police coming off an ice rink somewhere? Well, what had happened, it was a playoff game and... Uh, I, I guess the uh, fans from the other uh, opposing team got a little riled at the refereeing, and uh, I still recall it. I was scared to death because everybody came out, and she was I couldn't find Wayne, and you know the police were there to make sure there wasn't a problem. Uh, it, it was scary. If it's uh, never happened to you before, and it's the first time, you really see how people people can turn. Was this in Brantford? No, no, no. Where was, was this? Town. It was in Welland. Welland, Ontario. Yeah. All right, now, your book, your book, in which you were assisted by old Baldy <laughs> here, your book has been knocked on every sports page in the country. Now, why is that? Well, because uh, Wayne doesn't knock the National Hockey League. There's no profanity in it. Uh, there's no these dem does. Uh, it is not per se a National Hockey League book. There's not a bunch of guys running around with one big eye in the middle of their forehead. You know, it's a... We started to do a family book about the Gretzky family. Wayne is, is the central character, of course, but it basically is Wayne's story plus the story of what happens to a family in Brantford, Ontario, which is a tiny little pimple on the face of Ontario. And, uh, he's not talking about you, he's talking now, about Brantford. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, you're, you're, you're 13 years old and you need a police escort to get in out of the Colosseum because there's 15,000 people in there and you're flying all over the world and people want you. And what happens to the family, how you keep the balance, how it feels to be Wayne Gretzky's sister, 
How does it feel to be Wayne Gretzky's sister? She told me one day that if she could change one thing, that sometimes she just wishes her last name wasn't Gretzky. I mean, she's lying on the operating table. She's going to have surgery. She's going under the anesthetic. The doctor's leaning over and said, don't I, don't I know you? And, there's no, and the, the anesthetist says, the anesthetist says, well, don't anesthetist. you know? Anesthetist. 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 Ether person. Yeah. And uh, just leans over and says, well, don't you know her? That's, that's Wayne Gretzky's sister. You know, I mean, it, for all you know, they might have said, "Well, let's take a little souvenir <laughs> yeah, from Wayne yeah. Gretzky's sister." <laughs> now, souvenirs, garbage is stolen off the uh, in, in Brantford. There are no back lanes, so you put the garbage out on the boulevard, right? Cars pull up, and hands reach out, and they take the green garbage bags and they take them home because once in the, in the, the potatoes and the cabbage and everything else, there might be a note from Wayne. <laughs> People come up and they steal snatches of grass off the lawn. Raise your right hand and solemnly promise to tell me the truth. Is this a pack of lies? <laughs> no, he's telling you the truth. It's happened many times. Most of the people who come there, though, the car will drive up very slowly in front of the house, and somebody jumps out very quickly and they, with a camera, and they start snap, 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 and they jump back in and take off. But I have personally seen where someone will run out and grab a handful of grass off the front lawn and jump back into the car. I don't know what they're going to do with the grass, but... They're going to plant some in their own place and say this is Wayne Gretzky's grass, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky I never thought of that. <laughs> or even Walter Gretzky, the co-author of that famous book with Jim Taylor. This is some of his grass. That's grass, right. right. I mean, it's crazy. Grass. It's crazy. Grass, that reminds me. Why didn't you bring the boy up to be a de good, decent, normal NHL hockey thug? A thug? We have enough thugs in our country. How did he escape the thuggery of hockey? I mean, well, has he ever been in a fight once? There was once. I think he dropped his gloves twice, but I, it was most likely by accident, more than design. No, you have to remember, Wayne never was a, a big fella. And of course, when he was youngster, the Philadelphia team kind of ruled the roost, and if you couldn't beat him in the alley, the old story, you couldn't win on the ice. When he wanted to play the sport, now he's told him, you'll never play pro hockey. You're too small, and that's all there is to it. You're just too small. So Great scout, isn't he? <laughs> so when a day comes, who you Who told him that? Who said that? Walter did. So when you a day, told him that? Well, I always prepare him for the worst, and, you know, life is real. I, uh, but he wanted to play the sport. I said, well, Wayne, look, just learn to do the things that the big guys can't do. And, of course, uh, Wayne stuck to the basic fundamentals, and, and that's what's why he excels at those fundamentals. All right, next question. We'll give it to you. <laughs> This guy is good. Oh, I know. You didn't have to come at all this morning. I could have slept. Yeah. Um, does he not take an awful lot of heat from the thugs? There is a sort of a, there's the big myth that there's the unwritten law that you don't check Wayne Gretzky, and that's nonsense. He gets hacked and smacked and thudded around, and uh, he played the last two games of the Calgary series in the Stanley Cup last year. He's supposed to be a wimp, and he played it with a, with a dislocated shoulder that was just really, he shouldn't have been there at all. Who said? Did you say he was a wimp? Have you said on this program that Wayne Gretzky is a wimp? You're Jack, the guy that wrote the book a, about it? There is, a, there is a segment of population in this country waiting for Wayne to fall. They would really be delighted if he was found in bed with a sheep. You know, I mean, they just, they want him to fall down. Yeah. But he's not going to. More with Walter and, uh, You remember. <laughs> Jim Taylor on Gretzky after the break. Let me understand this business. I remember Skilbania and some big deal with Pocklington, and I was going to ask you, and I know I'm wrong, uh, has he only played for the Edmonton Oilers? And, uh, no, he, would, he was signed by Nelson Skilbania in, a, in the World Hockey Association, taken to Indianapolis. He played eight games for Indianapolis, and then he was sold to, to Peter Pocklington, who had the Oilers, who at that time were in the World Hockey Association. Yeah, well, did P Pocklington buy this piece of valuable human flesh and make a profit on him? Oh, I think probably he did, yeah. I mean, there was a... What did Wayne get when Pocklington took him to Edmonton? He got a free trip money. to Edmonton. Nothing. <laughs> he got... You mean nothing? <laughs> well, he, uh, Peter Pocklington carried on with the uh, contract that uh, was signed with Nelson Scalbania. He honored that contract, which, of course, has been rewritten twice since. Yeah, I mean, on the options and up. And then after Pocklington sold the Oilers too, didn't he? No. He still owns the others. He still owns the others, sure. But he's too busy. He's traveling about in his astral body, floating up and down the Nile and over the top of the Kremlin. Yeah, I thought he was belly up, Pocklington. No, I don't think so. Uh, 
he gets, you know, as I say, he's not paying Wayne terribly well at the moment, but I, I gather things, things are going, you know, for him all right. But anyway, he, Wayne was one year with the, with the World Hockey Association orders, then they joined the NHL, and Wayne's been in the NHL for, this is five straight years. He's won the Hart Trophy as the most valuable player every year he's been there. He's won the scoring championship the last four years, and he tied for it with Marcel Dion the first year. Well, he won't win the, the most outstanding athlete this year, will he, in Canada? I wouldn't think so. I would. Why think, not? Well, there'd be an Olympic athlete, and we all we all like to remember our Olympic athletes for at least six months after the Olympics, and then we forget them afterwards. I couldn't give you one name if you asked me right now. I, I understand that Wayne is upset at Taylor. Have you had this too? Well, we've been uh, traveling across the country. Jim's been telling everybody that uh, this year, uh, everybody's asked, well, what's what's he going to do this year? And very casually, Jim says, well, I think he's going to reach 100 goals. I've been misquoted. He asked me what Wayne's target was. That's the last defense of, a, of an inaccurate <laughs> columnist. You've been misquoted. I've been you said he was going to score 100 goals. I said he said he was, he, that he was going to try. That's a That's vastly a, different statement. That's true. It is a vastly different Well, let statement. me put it this way to you, witness. Do you think he can score 100 goals this year? Yes. Does Wayne think he can score 100 goals this year? Well, I wouldn't say this year. I do know he thinks it can be done. He got 92 once. I mean, what's another eight goals? Yeah, the guy's a bum. That's right. Imagine getting 92 goals and not getting 100 goals. Now, how has this changed your life, Walter Gretzky? Well, I'm here in Vancouver, where it does nothing but rain all the time. Are you complaining <laughs> about our weather? I did the first four times I was here. It's the only day it hasn't rained since I've been here. But about this, uh, Billy coming to Vancouver didn't change your life. Are you no. now retired in affluence and comfort? And have oh, you moved no. away from this house in Brantford no. where the garbage cans go out in no. the front street? We're still in the same home. Uh, I, st I still work at Bell Canada. What do you do at Bell Canada? I work in teletype and data. Installer repairman. Probably use you around here. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> bought me too. And you ha how about your wife? How has she taken all this glory? Or does she deserve more credit than you? Yes, I would have to you say You had to so. say that. You had to say that. Hey, what else? Well, uh, the thing about the book, perhaps, the, is that it was Wayne's idea. They, they knew that, uh, that Walter wanted to write a book someday. But Wayne wants Walter to retire. And he said, but he's too stubborn to take any money from me. So he said, maybe if we let my father write the book, then the money, whatever comes, will legitimately go to him, and he'll quit. So I said, what you're telling me really, Wayne, is if I screw up this book, I'm blowing your father's retirement. And he said, yes. Well, you've already got, what, 40,000 orders? 47,000 orders in the first three days, four days. The price always shocks me, but I'm told I'm out of date. 17.95. Jack, you buy, you buy pocket books. You'll wait a year. I know. I haven't bought a book in years. I get <laughs> reviewed copies. Don't be selling. <laughs> Hey, you didn't tell me how your, your wife took it. How old are you, by the way? I'll be 46 next week. God, just a boy, and here you're headed into retirement on the property. Retirement? Don't listen to what Taylor says. He well, won't retire. He won't retire. Are you Wayne's manager in a way? It's consultant, eh? Consultant, that's, that's a better word. Yeah. yeah. Wayne says, he said, I get, when, when a new deal comes up, he says, their marketing people talk to my marketing people, their lawyers talk to my lawyers, they come to me and say, what do you think? And when it's all settled, I phone Branford and say, Dad, can I do this? Good for him. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, you might as well pick, oh, you talk to Walter and pick Taylor's brains if you want if to. If you can find them. If you can find them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> After the break. That is not Jim Taylor. It's a tear sheet from Vancouver Magazine with an article about Jim Taylor in which he uses bad language. But there's a very important part here. What do you know about hockey? You don't even go to a hockey game. In fact, Harry Neal withdrew your parking pass because you hadn't attended enough to make it worth 140 bucks across the Canucks. Are you telling me that I don't know hockey because I don't go see the Canuck games? I would suggest that perhaps it proves that I do. <laughs> All right, let's give you another test. In what year did Bobby Hull score 50 goals? <laughs> Who cares? I, I have, I've edited that slightly. Uh, yes. That answer was very sincere, though. Who really gives a damn? I, I'm not a statistical nut. I, that's I don't a, believe that's it. That's true enough. Calls to uh, be for Walter, I bet. Certainly. Do you want to speak to Walter or Jimmy? Hello? Oh, no, the wrong one. Go ahead from Prince George. 
Okay, what I'd uh, like to ask is, uh, Walter, uh, why uh, uh, the younger Gretzky hasn't uh, done anything yet? The younger Gretzky, by the way, um, I was going to say something about the quality of that phone call, but I won't for the moment. That question sounds uh, as much as like uh, after uh, Wayne got over 200 points, I, I, I heard somebody say, uh, actually it was uh, management in one of the NHL teams that he's not very consistent. But uh, to answer your question a little better, Keith's 17 years old, he's playing major junior A right now. Okay, is he any good, Keith, the 17-year-old Jimmy? I've only seen him a couple of times. They figure that if he has a good year, he'll be a first-round draft choice. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, I'd like to talk to Jim for a minute, please. Sure. Mr. Taylor, you said that Wayne Gretzky played with a separated shoulder. Yes, sir. That is impossible. I am, I am a trainer. There is no way any player can play with a separated shoulder. A bruised shoulder, yes. Separated, no. Degree of separation, sir? Uh, okay, you're talking dislocated and pulled right out? I don't know. All I know is the tra what the trainers told me. You nailed them. Good show. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Morning. Good morning. On the ownership of Wayne, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, didn't Pocklington put up uh, the whole team as uh, collateral for a loan from the Heritage Fund? I had heard rumors to that effect. To tell you the truth, I didn't speak to Peter Pockington about the book or Glenn Sather because I thought it's Walter's book. We'll tell the family story and let the finances go to somebody else. I've heard that the bank owns a lot of the orders. Okay, boy, go ahead, please. Uh, I'd like to speak to Walter, please. Yeah, well, look, don't be a sports person. Be a normal caller to the program. You don't have to ask him to speak to Walter. <laughs> He's here. You've seen him. Okay, Same with um, Baldy. Go ahead. Was it true that Wayne Gretzky was in boxing when he was young? Yes. Surprise you, Jack? Yeah, a little story. Give me two paragraphs. <laughs> well, uh, he, he did fight with the Summer Hayes boys. Just trained. Yeah, no good, but he never got his face mess messed up, did he? Go ahead, please. Hi, this is for either uh, Jim or Mr. Gretzky. What did you think of uh, Tiger's comment mm. on uh, Gretzky and his new book? Oh, but he said they could teach him not to whine? Yeah. I think really comparing Tiger to Wayne is a lot like comparing Picasso to the guy who paints your back fence with a roller. I don't really pay too much attention to what Tiger says. But uh, doesn't Gretzky whine a little bit now and again? To put it the way uh, Wayne does, I am the captain of the team. It's my responsibility. To whine. <laughs> to complain. To complain. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I got a couple questions. Um, first of all, Walter, do you think that it's, do you think Wayne's happy that he's in Canada rather than playing in the States? I, I think it's probably good for the country as well. And for Jim, I know you're not a trivia buff, but can you tell me what is the only team that Wayne's played for that he never scored a goal for? I'll answer your first question, yes. Uh, Wayne's happy to play in Canada, although uh, if he has to, he'd, he'd play anywhere to be in the NHL. Uh, Wayne is a Canadian. He's always very proud of it, and, and he's always telling people that wherever he goes. All right. What team did he play for when he never scored a goal? I don't know. You, you've got me. I know that the lowest number of goals he ever scored in the season was one. Uh, th that was his first year because yeah, we have the We'll now get the accurate answer from, yeah, from a, a well-informed caller. Go ahead, please. I feel real embarrassed because I think I forgot, but it was a junior team. Yes, it was Peter Burry. He played three games for him oh, when they he was called 15 him up years to junior old. A. Yeah, that's right. He played junior B and he was called up for three games to junior A. On the time with Sue Marie Greyhounds, I believe. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd just like to say that um, there's been a lot of maligning to Wayne Gretzky. Um, a lot of people put him down and stuff. And I'd really like to say that that's really a shame to Canadian sports because Wayne Gretzky is obviously by, you know, no question of, you know, at all that he is the greatest hockey player, at, you know, to all times, you know. Um, you know, what, what does uh, Walter have to say to that? Well, actually, I'm very happy at times to hear some of these remarks because that's the driving force behind Wayne. He likes to prove people wrong. He give, it gives him targets, you know. When, it, when he was in his, uh, the one year in the, Western, in the World Hockey Association, when he came out of, the, out of the WHA, he'd finished third in scoring at 17, and he heard somebody say, driving on a car, he said, well, he'll never finish third in the NHL. And he looked up and he said, third. I got to finish third. He said, first or second would be okay, but I got to finish third. And, of course, he tied for first. Good. More calls to Gretzky and Taylor after the break. The book is Gretzky, the author is Walter, the co-author is Jim Taylor of Le Provence. 
That is at La Provence, the female newspaper. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask Walter, how do you go about training a five-year-old boy to become a star at night? You don't. <laughs> that answers that question. You just uh, go out with him and uh, be a parent. Enjoy you have a five-year-old boy. Go ahead from Vernon. Yeah, so I'd agree that um, Gretzky is a good hockey player. I'd like to know what happened uh, to him during the Canada Cup. Whether he had, uh, <laughs> was he injured or cause he didn't play up to the expectations, but I figured he'd play against uh, uh, he, Swedes I, and the Russians. I, I take your point. The fact is that when he had that terrible series, he finished leading the Canada Cup in scoring. But he, he changed his style slightly, and uh, I think you might agree, sir, that he played the best defensive hockey that anybody has ever seen him play. Uh, he'd had some food poisoning. He, his weight was down a little bit. No excuses. He never offered any. But he did play a good defensive series, and he did lead the Canada Cup in scoring. Go ahead from Port Albany. Hello, Jack. Hello there. Yeah, I'm just glad I have the opportunity to say that uh, I'm really glad that uh, Mr. Gretzky is visiting Vancouver right now and that uh, we really love his son out here and that uh, he's done more for hockey, I think, than any other player and that I think in the future he'll be doing even more. And I just hope he stays in Canada. Me too. <laughs> Wonderfully nice calls. I always thought myself that Bobby R was much more impressive and physical on the ice and more gracious to watch than Walter, than Wayne. He certainly was Walter. Walter. There's no doubt but about that. But am I not right now? Wasn't perceptive. Bobby R the most gracious, most lithe animal on the ice? He was, he, he was a, a more stylish skater. I mean, when Bobby Orr took the puck behind the net and started out, you could sort of go, <gasps> a lot like when Willie Fleming ran, you know? Mm -hmm. but, but Wayne skates in a slightly more awkward fashion, but uh, he's, he's going to shatter every record that Bobby Orr ever moved, you know? Go ahead, please. Good morning. First of all, uh, Jim, great picture of you in the Vancouver magazine. Yeah, say, he's going to appear in Penthouse next week. <laughs> Second of all, Walter, isn't it true that uh, one of uh, Wayne's greatest assets is uh, his anticipation of the play? Absolutely. And they say that you can't teach this, but didn't you, when he was younger, tell him that he should go where the puck isn't instead of uh, you know where it you know where it is and where it will end up to be? No, no. The saying is, go to where it's going to be, not where it's been. Yeah, but excellent. I, but I do believe it can be taught. You had a broken nose, haven't you? Yes. I, were you a hockey player? Yes. <laughs> Pity he didn't fix your nose right. <laughs> <laughs> Super player. Junior B. He, junior B. He only played good. Junior B. He couldn't make Junior A, but as he says, I had chicken pox during my tryout, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Where are you? Hello. That's you, sir. Yes. Uh, like to what thing? I think that up to now, people have been comparing Wayne Gretzky to the infamous Rommel. Infamous who? I didn't quite get the... Rommel? Rommel! The dog, Desert Fox. Well, I must say that's a great comparison, sir, but they don't play <laughs> hockey in sand. You can't flood sand. I've noticed that. It's a, it, the water keeps sort of sinking down. Go, I don't, go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Gretzky. Yeah. Hello. I'm, I, I'd like to comment that I think the uh, boo birds that have uh, booed uh, Wayne during the years should realize that he's playing as hard as he is, even though his contract doesn't come up for renewal this year or the last year or whatever. I think too many of these players play strictly the year that their contract's coming up for renewal. <laughs> well, I don't think that all of them do. Uh, most athletes have a certain amount of pride re regardless of how much uh, they get paid uh, one way or the other. It, they all have a driving force behind them. Well, it seems that Wayne has the, a really good driving force. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, Wayne has been probably one of our better ambassadors uh, abroad because... Better uh, than Bryce McAtee, I'll tell you that. <laughs> right on. Uh, I've noticed, uh, I've been down in the southern states where they don't follow hockey at all, and people always know about Wayne Gretzky and are asking about him. That's right. Great stuff, eh? Oh, yes. Nice to do happy programs. Sure. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, compliment Walter on his fine son, uh, Wayne. I play hockey myself, and it seems to me all the people that have anything bad to say about him are the people that, don't even, that, that haven't even skated or even played hockey. They don't even know if they're right or left handed. Fair enough. Fair enough. And also, there's, uh, all the great ones are booed. Bobby R. was booed. 
uh, Jean Beliveau was booed, Maurice Richard was booed, they were all booed, and I think partially it's frustration because he isn't yours. Remember how Vancouver fans used to boo Tiger Williams and call him a thug? Mm -hmm. Then he came here and suddenly he was their thug. Well, I've lived in Vancouver five years now and I always vowed I'd go for Vancouver once they got rid of Harold Snap and Tiger Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obligated. Now you're obligated. They've called your bluff. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jim, how many records has Gretzky broke? How many has he broke? God. How many has he broke? He's broken several. I don't, uh, I don't know. 20, 24? No, it's, it's over 30, close to 40. Walter keeps track of these things. You know how I feel about statistics. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm wondering. His contract goes till 1999. Oh, he's going to be pretty old by 1999. Will he still be worth anything then? Well, I wouldn't think he'd be playing in 1999. Uh, that's, what, 15 years from now. He would be an old man of 39 years old, but by the way the league is watering down, he probably still could if he chose to. Go ahead, please. Oh, hi. Yes, I'd just like to make a comment, and it's directed to Jim Taylor. I agree that Wayne Gretzky is undoubtedly the best player in North America, but after watching the Canada Cup, uh, the lines he was playing against seemed to me to be just as superior in all the fundamentals as he is. Uh, what, do you, uh, what comment do you have on that? I think Wayne probably made as good a comment as any. He said that when you're playing in the National Hockey League, sometimes when you go out, you're going out against third lines. He said that when you're playing the Canada Cup, you're never going out against, you know, even ordinary hockey players. There were some great hockey players on, on, on the Russian team. Gudin played for Sweden, didn't Yes, Gudin, Kent Nilsson, Hakan Lube, who just... Uh, the Europeans come over here, and I think they're better versed in fundamentals than we are. You're absolutely right, sir. Go ahead, please. From Smithers, B.C. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I was in Edmonton about a year ago with my boys, and uh, I met Wayne at a, one of his autograph signing sessions, and uh, he wasn't just your regular superstar, he was a regular person, and uh, that was really important, I think, for the boys and for their dad. Uh, Walter, uh, I want to know uh, what a hockey parent's like when he brings up a boy like that. Is there the pressure, the push? Uh, how do the coaches feel about their dad? How do coaches feel about me? Well, some like me, some dislike me. I'm just like everybody else. Uh, I love my kid, and uh, I don't like to. Uh, I don't like to see anybody take runs at him. But uh, you've never belted another parent. <laughs> no, I'm not big. You haven't to do kept that. up the New Westminster Bruin tradition of belting anyone <laughs> no. within reach. However, I'm... his mother belted a hockey player. <laughs> Who Walter's mother? Well, Walter's mother. You know, Walter's mother. Yeah, you know, Wayne's mother. Walter, Wayne's grandmother. Wayne. You know how Paul Reinhardt, who plays for <clears throat> Calgary, when they were both little kids, Paul played for the other team, and Mrs. Gretzky was sitting down right at at ice level, and there was no glass at that time, and Paul was a big kid, and Wayne was a little guy, and Paul went in and mashed Wayne in the boards, clean check, but he was pinning him against the boards, and Mrs. Gretzky leaned over with her purse and started smacking him with her purse, and said, "You let him go. You let him go." <laughs> Paul tells a story, and nobody believes him. I've got to take a minute with you right sure. now. Explain something for me. Are the white caps down the two? I would think so. I have, I've been away for a week, but I would guess yes. Gone forever. Yeah, there'll be a new league, new Canadian Soccer League will start up within a year, and it, there'll be a team here, but I don't think the North American Soccer League has got a chance. Are the Lions as poor as ever this year? No, they're a very good football team. Are yeah. the Canucks going to make the NHL playoffs? Mind you, they could go straight to the playoffs anyway, because everybody gets into the playoffs. They'll make the playoffs with a note from your mother, and I think they will. They will, eh? Yes. They'll get the note. And what year will the Canucks win the Stanley Cup? Gee, I don't know. I think they're going in the right direction. I, I poke fun at them and everything else, but I, I think... You don't even go to the games. I, well, they give me a parking pass, I'll go. Harry Neal doesn't <laughs> like you. I like Harry, that's fine. Well, no, they're going in the right direction, Jack. They're going with young kids, and they're, and they're working hard. I'm doing this for you, not for him. I don't normally do this, but he might write nasty things about me, and he's... <laughs> oh, calling. that would sure hurt he you. He would. <laughs> uh, tonight, you're autographing books with Baldy in New Westminster Mall, half past seven to eight. And tomorrow in the morning, 11 o'clock, here at Woodward's in Richmond, Lansdowne, and at 3.30 at the Guildford Shopping Centre in Surrey. Yes. That's it. And that's it. And do you manage to get your name written all right? I make the big J and then the little I, and I, I fake it from there. Uh, yeah. He makes the X and you witness yeah. it as his X. No, really, I'll tell you, you haven't seen him write. A little eight-year-old girl said, uh, <laughs> you better learn how to write English. Yeah, she was autographing. I said, I can understand why nobody can read your columns in, Jim. <laughs> so I hit her. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough, <laughs> you bully. Nice to meet you, Walter. You were a pleasant surprise. He was predictably bright and pleasant. Gretzky. Now, next. What am I doing next? Oh, yeah, this incredible business about kindergarten courses <laughs> to prevent to alcoholism with Monica Homer from New York after break. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, fine. You could do that one. No, that's okay. I do 90 You're a quick a man. A <coughs> most of it is hard stuff. It's not soft stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I envy you with the quickness of your 15, thinking and, and such. Being in the business, 52 goddamn years. Oh, they must have been good years. You wouldn't yeah. have hung in there. One is shocked at nothing these days. We know there are drugs in the schools. We know there are incredible drinking problems among adults. And of course, British Columbia, as usual, reads, leads Canada in the death rates from chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, which is largely alcoholic in populations age 20 and over. We lead in almost every statistic relating to alcohol in the country of Canada. We are worse than most places. We know that, as I was saying, that there are drugs in the schools. We know that teenager drinks. But did you ever think that a course would be available for kindergarten to warn grades from kindergarten up to four, five, and six about the evils of alcohol? Monica Homer, who's a doctor and from the New York, uh, runs over 100 workshops in 25 states in alcohol education and traffic safety for junior high and elementary schools. Tell me, is it as bad as it would appear to be when you produce courses for kids in kindergarten on boozing? The problem is bad, Jack, uh, in, as your statistics say, about the amount of alcoholism that's existing in our adult population. Uh, the alcoholism problem is not within the kindergarten grades, but what we're trying to do is to start them early learning about alcohol, not just the evils, to understand that drinking in moderation, if one chooses, is acceptable. Uh, we feel it's a lot easier to start positive habits than to try in the teen years to break some negative ones. Now, is this another example where the education system must step in to supply some kind of model and some kind of discipline and training that just isn't available in these millions of broken homes and unstable homes in our new society? Absolutely. Unfortunately, parents can't be expected to teach all things. Many times we have working parents. They're busy. And in fact, some of them are not even educated about the other aspects of drinking. So what we're trying to do is be a catalyst to increase the conversations at home, but also to give them accurate information. Well, let's try this. You know, when I picked up your book uh, when you came in this morning, I thought, goodness gracious me, as we said, Froggy and Dodo have a drinking problem. Okay, let's see if, we can, if I can do this. I'm not very good at the Johnny Carson thing, but we'll go through the slides one at a time, shall we? And we'll both Certainly. talk about them. There is Froggy, and there is Dodo, and there is a can of beer. You re read the line if you can. can All you? right. Hey, Dodo, look down there. Somebody left a beer can next to your bird bath. This would go to kindergarten kids. This is a second grade activity. This is second grade. Then we come up to the next one. You do Dodo, I'll do Froggy. Okay, I'll go the high voice. Hey, Froggy, have you ever tasted beer? No, I only drink water. How about you? No, I only drink water, too. How about going down and taking a sip? No one's around. Okay, let's go. Good. Okay, I'm Froggy. You go first, Dodo. Do you think we should? Oh, you're chicken. I'll try it first. All right. I'm Froggy. Hey, it sure tastes different from water. Let me try. Down it goes. How do you feel? I'm starting to feel a little funny. Well, let's go back up on the bed bath and rest. Let's just relax and get some sun. OK, but I'm feeling kind of dizzy. Me too. Hey, Dodo, I've been meaning to ask you, what does it feel like to fly? It's great, Froggy. You feel free and weightless. Sounds like fun. Do you think that I could learn to fly? Sure, why not? He's flying already on the <laughs> can of beer, as That's we'll right. see. All you have to do is flap your little legs and leap off the birdbath, like this. Just keep flapping your little green legs. Hey, I feel funny, like my wings are wet. They feel very heavy. Watch out, Dodo. Look where you're going. Wham, bam, into the tree. Back again. Ugh. What happened, Dodo? Didn't you see that tree? I don't know. Somebody must have moved it. But that's all right. It's your turn. Give it a try. You can do it. Here I go. Kerplunk. What happened, Froggy? I guess frogs really can't fly. I guess drunk birds can't either. 
You know, Dodo, I learned an important lesson. Even just a little alcohol can cause some people to lose some judgment and even do things which they might not try if they hadn't been drinking. Yeah, Froggy, like frogs trying to fly. And I learned an important lesson, too. After drinking alcohol, a simple thing for me, like flying, can be very hard to do. I couldn't see clearly and my wings didn't work right. I could have broken my neck. You're right, Dodo. I guess people could get hurt, too, if they tried to do things that need good judgment, like riding a bike or driving a car. After drinking alcohol, we were really lucky we didn't get hurt even more. Hey, that's effective in the classroom. That's it. Well, we tell them the story, but then we work through the story of getting them to understand what was it that they drank, what does it contain, alcohol. Alcohol is a drug. Mm -hmm. And then its effects. For instance, on the bird, the effects were his vision because he bumped into the tree. He couldn't work his wings right, so it affected his coordination. And of course, Froggy didn't use very good judgment because frogs can't fly. They don't have wings. Yeah, we're going through the usual caper right now where we give driving licenses out at 16 and where the drinking age is 19. And such is the preponderance of accidents among all people, but especially young people with drinking fatalities, that we're going to raise them. Have you done that in New York? Have you raised the levels? Well, we've gone from 18 to 19. For um, driving? No, for drinking. For drinking. Mm. For drinking. That's where we're right. at now, 19. Right. right. But I sometimes wonder if it's pointless trying to change ages. It's attitudes you've got to change. Exactly. Those are external controls, law enforcement well, and can, laws. Can we ever? Have you ever seen, have you seen any improvement in the years you've been working in alcohol and safety education with youngsters or with oldsters? Have you seen any improvement? Do you feel that we're getting any more sane about it or do we still rely virtually on the jail and the flog and the lash to keep people in line? I think society in general relies on external forces to control our behavior. But I do find that people, even teachers who are starting to teach the program, parents who are hearing about different forms of alcohol education, are starting to think twice. We were very effective in our smoking education. Oh, and that good. youngsters went back to the homes and started to talk to mom and dad about that. And I think this is the same kind of an approach to make the youngsters aware, to educate their parents, uh, parents are concerned very much about this issue, not only for themselves, but for their young Were you involved in the smoking campaign at all? Uh, not in its total national campaign. I did it on a local level. Well, that would be very effective. Yes. Because when I was a stupid kid of 14 or something, when I first did a cigarette, the old people in the community would say they were coffin nails, but it was a mark of macho behavior to be able to get a packet of cigarettes and smoke them. That's right. But Isn't drinking the same? I suppose drink, drinking yeah. was the same. Not for me, it didn't happen to mm -hmm. be the same, but I can understand that yeah. for many people. See, it's a sign of maturity. It's that passageway that uh, goes into adulthood. And therefore, youngsters think if they drink, they are acting in an adult way. Now, in this uh, course in school, is this the kind of course which can be taught exactly like you and I might have been teaching it, merely by demonstrating this to the kids? This eh? is part of the story so that they start to realize that the effects of alcohol are on judgment and vision and coordination. Then we connect it to those particular skills needed in driving a car. It's very important. The younger you get them and brainwash them a bit for good, brainwashing for good is not a bad thing. That's right. That's right. And as I say, it's not a judgmental program that it is condemning anyone who chooses to drink on a social level. What it's really trying to do is combat some of the myths, myths conceptions that we have about drinking, that it's not the magic potion, the elixir, um, that it can cause some problems too. Yeah, of course, we've, we have whole massive legal industries uh, uh, predicated on the basis that if you've got enough money you can be any charge and you never have to go to jail and all the rest of it. Maybe we should have a simple arbitrary control of traffic safety. <laughs> <laughs> or is that, that's unthinkable in our society, yeah, isn't it? A little bit. More with Monica Homer. I will take some calls on this. Do you think, would you like your kids to get this, uh, where am I? Taught them in school? Dope, do you do it for dope too? Not this particular program, but there are other programs that deal with the dope. We'll talk about booze for, not for kids, but warning children about the evils of alcohol after the break.
invited me to attend several seminars. Well, we on don't know whether or not this is actually going to be used in the schools here yet, do no, we? No, at this particular point, we are introducing the program. Yeah, making it available, you might say. That's right. Okay, let's go to the phones. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to say uh, what I think uh, Monica has in mind there is on the right line because uh, kids do end up seeing what their parents are doing, and if they see their parents can drink, you know, they think uh, that's all right. And if they see the parents smoke, they think, well, that's all right. And they get older, they just copy. So you wouldn't mind this kind of program in the schools, I gather. Go ahead, please. Hello, I have a quick question. I'm just wondering if there, if anyone has uh, come up with any um, statistics, sort of uh, preliminary statistics, that to uh, support whether the program actually works yet or not. Yeah. It's an interesting question. We um, developed the program over a period of three years, and then we traveled around the United States to about eight different states and worked with 200 and some odd teachers and 6,000 students. And we did do a pre and post test on them, and there was significant level of difference between a change in their knowledge and in their attitudes. Now, obviously, it has not been in effect at this particular point long enough to determine whether their actual behaviors in their teen years uh, will be modified by the program. However, if we wait that long before we try to institute a program such as this, we're going to have a lot more tragedies in those 10 or 15 years we have to wait. Mind you, there is a much more consciousness there was than there was 20 years ago of the physical health of the individual, is it not? Absolutely. And much that, more concern about Much more concern about that. Go, go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to uh, comment on the alcohol program. I hope it does come into the school. <laughs> go on. As uh, I'd like to uh, say the smoking program, my young boy did go to school. I smoked for 30 years, and he came home and convinced me to quit smoking with the program. And I hope the alcohol program works as well. Thank you. Call that child pressure, and it's great. There are a number of cars in our family, my own somewhat large family, where they attempt to get me to not to smoke at all. And I must say, I resent it greatly. But occasionally I'll give in. I'll sit in the back seat or something. So family pressure is one of the most effective forms of pressure, although it is infuriating. That's right. Some whippersnapper tell you, don't smoke in my car, Dad. But because you love them, you'll listen. Well, I have my doubts about it at that particular moment. <laughs> you know what I mean. Go ahead, please. I, I've got to uh, give you guys compliments. This is uh, sure a better education than Shakespeare. <laughs> Well, now I don't know. Methinks you, pro you doth protest too much. It's the only Shakespeare I can think of. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, uh, I think this program is marvelous. I'm just wondering uh, perhaps why the government in the United States and Canada has not uh, considered it a priority and sort of made it the regular school curriculum. I have they made it the regular school curriculum in any of the states with which you've been involved? Yes, in most of the states, I, I will speak primarily for New York State, it is a requirement that alcohol and drug education be taught all the way through from elementary into the high school. Uh, unfortunately, there's a pressure within the educational system of including a lot of programs, and one must choose which programs to choose, which subject areas are the most important. But this is a simple matter of basic social, what do you call it, social, what do you call it, what kind so, of courses, it's social studies. It's a form of social studies. I mean, mm -hmm. that could be incorporated very cheaply into every elementary school in the country, could it not? And you see, something that's special about this program, Jack, is that we are very aware that elementary school teachers are bound into teaching arithmetic, writing, and literary skills. And what we've incorporated in each of the lessons are actual arithmetic problems. However, the answers then are decoded into messages about alcohol. So they're doing two jobs at one time. And uh, what's next one? Go ahead, please. Hello. Are you there? Yes, I am. Where are you speaking from? Fort Coquitlam. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay, I have two things to bring up. Number one it was the drinking and two, the smoking. I was raised by very good parents, taught that both were very detrimental to my health. Um, as far as education in my home went, it was beautiful. Then I wound up getting, I met my husband, and before I got married to him, I gave him a bad time about smoking. I tossed him out of it. He quit for about five years, eh? You tossed him what? Talk to my husband. Then he quit smoking for about five years, eh? Yeah. yeah. Fine. Then I move into a neighborhood. Uh, education goes a long way, sure, but turn around and all these other girls were slim. I never thought that it was a natural fact that I was sort of related to you don't get a little tiny pony out of a Clydesdale horse, eh? 
But I figured, okay, I can be skinny like the rest of the women. They smoke. They don't have coffee and cake. They sit around and they smoke and whatnot. Fine, I started smoking. I'll regret it till the end of my life. I definitely know it. And you're still fat. Oh, yes. I lost maybe 20 pounds at the time, but then I gained it back. And then progressively, you become a creature of habit. It's like driving the same route to get home all the time when you've got alternate routes. Good girl, that's a kind of sad story. I put a little soap opera within the program. No, but, but the whole thing is, is that drinking was the same. I remember I would buy a bottle of Coke. My husband, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I don't, you don't have to, you're coming along fine. Okay. My husband would say to me, hey, that's very immature. Now I'll admit I was young and I was raising children. I did everything according to what I was supposedly supposed to do. Everything I had been taught, my parents said, all this is detrimental to your health. I was avoiding it except for the smoking, which I used to hide from my mom and pretend I wasn't. Even though I was married and had children of my own, I didn't want her to know that I was missing up. And to cut a long story short? Now I drink, but it started out with, I just wanted to have a bottle <laughs> of pop once in a while. Uh, Thank that. you, ma'am. May I just add a part to that, yeah. that alcohol consumption will increase weight far quicker than uh, withdrawing from cigarettes. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> I know. I stopped drinking on the 2nd of January. I went on the Pritikin diet, and I have lost 32 pounds. Congratulations. And I think I'm wonderful. You should think so. But I have another 20 pounds to go. <laughs> and that ain't don't so be easy. All. <laughs> My thanks to Monica Homer. Best of luck with uh, Froggy and Dodo and their drinking problems. Thank you very much. I'll be back with the uh, <clears throat> story in the General Hospital after the break. As a member of the general public, or as a small businessman, you're about to get a pitch to give money. And normally when one gets pitches to give money, one says, ah, let the government do it. This particular pitch, and if you're a big corporate citizen, you have been asked and will be asked again to give to this particular campaign, which is for the Vancouver General Hospital Research Institute, which is already going up an oak between 10th and 11th, and for which some five and a half million dollars has to be raised. Now, I've got two men here to talk about it. The first is Dr. Martin Law, who is director of the Research Institute and a distinguished researcher, General Hospital and elsewhere in his own right. And then we've got my old friend, not that Law isn't an old friend, my old friend Ed Phillips front and center for many years as a spokesman for West Coast Transmission, who is the campaign chairman. And I'm going to go right to you. I'm a cynical businessman, you know, sick and tired of pitches for money. And I say, what the hell's going on in this province? We've got UBC Hospital, we've got St. Paul's, we've got the General, which is our mainstay. Why are you appealing to the public for money to build a research center? I thought the whole business was socialized. <laughs> Well, the whole business has been socialized, uh, and uh, in a sense. But uh, the reason we're asking the public for money now is because uh, the government simply doesn't have enough to provide for this kind of, of facility uh, in all of the hospitals that need that sort of facility. What guarantee have I got as a common sense member of the public, if I can be classified as such, that research is being coordinated at UBC, St. Paul's, and that further research is, and I know there are many cures to be found, essential at the general. Yeah. Well, most of the hospitals, uh, in fact, virtually all of the hospitals in the uh, lower mainland area that are doing research are doing it uh, with a more or less formal relationship with UBC. So there, there are two levels of uh, coordination, if you like, of research activity in the Lower Mainland. Uh, the most important one being through the uh, research administration at UBC. And there is another level of coordination uh, among the hospitals that are building research institutes or that have them. And that is through a, a liaison committee that I chair. And it includes representatives from every one of the uh, hospitals in the Lower Mainland that have research facilities. Uh, Mr. Phillips, I can take that assurance that uh, research monies is properly directed and devoted in specific areas in UBC without overlap, in BC without overlapping. Yes, Jack, you've touched on a question that the business community asked us immediately when they come in as business people there. Want to be assured there isn't duplication 
that are, we're not chasing some uh, pie in the sky type of research and we have been able to tell them that this is very relevant that the research is being done at the spot where there are the most patients requiring the particular agenda or program of that institute dr lowe has an agenda for uh, Vancouver General, there's a different agenda or, shall we say, a schedule of work at St. Paul's and Shaughnessy, and it's all coordinated. And the business community, by the way, uh, have accepted our presentation on that basis. All right, but you still want more money. We have to have the five and a half million dollars to pay for this uh, uh, new facility. But you've already started construction. In fact, are you halfway through? Uh, more than halfway through. Uh, we're virtually complete. The bu building will be occupied early in 1985 and will be operating. You see, there is a program going on now in Vancouver General, but it's been going on in an inefficient and, uh, I would say, unsatisfactory way in corridors, in lean-tos and so on. Dr. Lowe has a fine staff of people uh, working, but that staff plus some newcomers who can be recruited with the proper facility will do uh, much more. And there isn't a community that is more deserving, and there isn't a hospital more deserving than Vancouver General. It's a mammoth hospital with uh, an international recognition for its size, teaching hospital for doctors and nurses and so on. This is a very relevant and acceptable project. How are you doing for money? We're about halfway there, uh, and quite honestly, uh, that is not where we wanted to be. We'd hope we might be finished uh, by uh, November this year. But the uh, financial circumstances are difficult, and we've had to accept that. Now, well, of the five and a half million, how much does the government give you? Any at all? Uh, none at all in the five and a half million. They do not have funds provided for the research institute, as you know. They give uh, great sums of money to the basic hospital. But as to the research uh, institute, uh, in this case and in the other hospitals, the private sector and the public have to do it alone. And by the way, they're accepting this challenge, and but, we will do it. But don't you get some money from UBC's gen U the university's general budget for research throughout the province and hospitals? Uh, yes, a year and a half ago, when this uh, dispersal, if I call it, of the specialties to the various areas was planned, uh, UBC contributed uh, $500,000, which was a magnificent sum for us uh, to start off with. In other words, the first half million of our five and a half million campaign. Uh, as a volunteer uh, uh, campaigner, I was encouraged also by the next largest, which was uh, $200,000 from the doctors at VG8. Uh, they passed the hat. That's a rather indelicate term to use, but... Uh, you got to be they, joking. The doctors themselves put up $200,000? Yes, they did. Uh, which was very significant because the Vancouver General, no, the Vancouver Foundation were impressed by this uh, support and uh, dedication, I might even use that word, of the doctors. And they came forward with 150000 and they were encouraged by the doctor's contribution. But you'll be happy to get 50 bucks or 20 bucks or 10 bucks or whatever you can from members of the general Absolutely. public. Absolutely, and those are coming in now. The mailings have reached the homes just in the past week. That part of the campaign is just now gathering steam. I'm appalled to hear, as Ed said, that you're doing research in corridors and makeshift shacks and lean-tos and whatnot, still mm. in 1984? Still in 1984, Jack, unfortunately. We do have some reasonable research facilities at the hospital, but the place was never uh, designed or, or constructed in the first place to be part of a modern university medical center, which it must be now because of its many responsibilities. I want to ask you what kind of research you're going to do and how it's allocated between the various hospitals, realizing full well that the general is the principal research hospital in BC, right? Yes. With Dr. Martin Lowe and with Ed Phillips after the break. Is there not a kind of attitude among the public nowadays that really, and I perhaps referred to this before, we expect the government to do everything in medical affairs. I mean, we don't pay bills, there's no deterrent fee as such, we have some user fees, but we kind of expect that uh, we shouldn't be asked for money to support research. That is true. The public asks that question, and, uh, and more to my consternation, uh, some business people ask that. And I'm astonished that we come from business people because they must know what that would lead to. Jack, if all of us abdicate uh, our opportunity and responsibility to give to various charities and say the government has to do it all, 
we then say the government has to do it for us, not only provide the money to do it for us and to use the old uh, joke, uh, I certainly wouldn't go into Vancouver General Hospital if it was being run like the post office. No. Uh, I might be shifted off to the maternity ward when I was looking for the cardiac section and we'd, uh, we'd have to change the period of gestation because they'd never deliver on time. <laughs> so. But research itself has suffered by the lack of government support, broadly speaking, especially from Ottawa in the medical area, has it not? It certainly has. <clears throat> Canada, uh, as a nation, contributes uh, an amount to biomedical research that is really not, uh, it's not fair in terms of, of uh, how we should be meeting our responsibilities. We, Canada spends something like 0.8% of its gross national product on, on uh, biotechnical research as compared to 1.7% of the gross national product of the United States which is spent in the same way. As yeah. compared to 2.5% in, uh, in Japan or 2.3% in West Germany. Now what kind of research <laughs> are you now doing or going to be doing in this which is obviously essential research but what kind of research are you going to be doing in the new, you call it the Cure facility, don't you? Yes. Cure, is that right? The cure Drive. The Cure Drive. Yes. Help us solve the puzzle. Okay. What are the specific areas of expertise in which you should be in charge of, I gather? Yes, we're, we're, uh, we're going to take on, and we have been uh, working on, on problems that uh, directly affect the citizens of British Columbia. Particularly, we're we have been focusing on and with this facility we'll be able to to do a great deal more work in the area of lung disease for example chronic lung disease uh, that workers in in grain elevators might get because of exposure to grain dust that miners might get because of exposure to the hydrocarbons and the asbestos particles and that sort of thing in the mines that workers in smelters might get because of their exposure to the chemicals in that environment and uh, that workers in our forest industry might get because of exposure to uh, wood dust. Uh, you mean in sawmills? Yes, Some red cedar dust. What do you call it? Uh, there is a particular lung disease that can result in very serious asthma called red cedar lung disease and we have uh, probably the world's most knowledgeable experts uh, in that field of research and in, and in care. You mean that beautifully smelling kind of brown red cedar sawdust can That's do right. a hell of a lot of damage if you suck in the sawdust. That's right, it may. Now, is this new research you're doing there for in the lung area, respiratory areas? No, that sort of research has been going on for quite a long time. The Vancouver General Hospital has a tradition of excellent research in lung disease, beginning with the work that Dr. Grabowski and his team have done in, in uh, dealing with tuberculosis in this province. And uh, is TB gone now, just by the way. Well, not unfortunately, it isn't, and uh, it's just about gone in in uh, the urban populations. But still, unfortunately, some of our native people uh, do get uh, tuberculosis. Other areas after we do lung and respiratory and forestry mining and grain handling. What, are, what other specific areas are you going to be tackling there? Well, we have, uh, just because of the uh, construction of this research institute, we have been able to, to uh, assemble all of the final pieces to uh, complete our research team in kidney disease. Vancouver General Hospital has also got a... You've well, always been a leader yes, in kidney disease that's and right. dialysis. That's correct, and with the help of our corporate friends, uh, particularly CP Limited, who contributed a great deal to that program. Um, but because we have this facility now, we have been able to uh, to bring some physicians and scientists who are experts in, for example, the sorts of problems that uh, that uh, you might run into with transplantation uh, rejection in formation of kidney stones. Well, that mm -hmm. Kidney stones aren't life-threatening, but they can be extremely painful and can uh, can be a difficult problem for the individual who has them. Uh, so we, we will be doing a lot of work in the area of kidney disease as well as lung disease. What about deafness? I believe you're doing something in yes, deafness. Yes, the, the provincial uh, ear bone bank will be in the institute. And, Have we got uh, one yet, an ear bone bank? Yes, it's at VGH. And, can I uh, donate an ear bone? Yes, you can. <laughs> Preferably not until the uh, until uh, due until time. Until the due time, yes. But an ear bone <laughs> bank, yes. which can cure certain types of deafness. That's right. Is this kind of a first time round research or are we just developing somebody else's thesis? Well, it's uh, it, that the kind of uh, 
of uh, understanding necessary to do that has been around for a while, but this is unique in the province. I've got to make a joke. <laughs> I hear so much garbage from, garbage from politicians that one morning I shall take out both my ear bones and give them <laughs> to, you. to the <laughs> Just so I don't have to listen anymore. It's only a joke. <laughs> Any special research in uh, areas of cancer? Yes, uh, two or three different ones, particularly in the area of lung cancer, of course. Uh, we have a, an extensive program aimed at uh, finding ways to detect lung cancer very early. And of course, the earlier you can detect it, the better the chances are you're going to survive. The earlier you can detect it, the sooner you can stop smoking, I believe. <laughs> is that correct? Yes. Now, OK, your campaign uh, is going to keep going? I mean, what It is going to keep going, yes. Uh, uh, we will be carrying on with our volunteer staff, uh, particularly as we uh, move back to some of the companies who were not able to incorporate us in their 1984 budget. Jack, this, this year was the pits in BC. We recognize that. And a number of companies Tough. we know to be generous companies have said, please, uh, uh, could you see us in 1985? So we're going to maintain a group of volunteers to carry on through to 1985. And on that basis, we think we will meet our target. But it's the public right now that is current, and we the have public. The, you want to get at. We have uh, these notices out to the homes, and by the way, they uh, they're just. May I tell you one little personal story? Yes, yes. I'm obviously canvassing in the major corporations personally, but I received a call from one citizen here who wanted to see me, wanted to make his contribution. I went to see him, and he said, "All right, Phillips, I don't want a long pitch from you and everything else. I've written out a check. It's here, so relax." But I wanted to tell you why. I was just in VGH. I had a successful prostate operation, and I was informed during this procedure that I was the beneficiary of some little technique. He emphasized little. It wasn't earth-shattering. And I benefited from that, and will you please take my check? But I wanted you to know it's an appreciation of what happened to me. That gift meant more to me than the corporate gift that could have been a 100 times larger. Nice to say that. My thanks to Ed Phillips. Keep saying West Coast Transmission, you're still a director. Yes, that's right. And to Dr. Martin Moore, director of the uh, research at General Hospital, particularly building the Vancouver General Research Institute called the Cure Drive. Thanks, Martin. Be 25 years before you get my ear bones. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Jack. I hope so. At After least. the break. <laughs> Canadian astronaut. They took off this morning. What time did they take off this morning? Um, the first Canadian is in space. Reporter Steve Wyatt is with me now to update me on what's happening this morning. When you went on this morning, Jack, another Canadian began a trip around the world and he's just about finished it. Mark Garneau, the first Canadian astronaut, went up on the latest shut mission uh, with the space shuttle Challenger and he took off this morning at 4.56 our time. He's the seasickness expert. That's right. Yeah. Eight. Go for main engine start. Seven. Six. We have main engine start. Five. Three. Two. One. Zero. We have SRB ignition, and the history's largest astronaut crew is on its way. Houston controlling now. All main engines running at 100 percent. Roll program initiated. 120 degree roll. Maneuver ship at its 57 degree inclination with the uh, crew heads down and wings level. Throttling down to 92 percent. Main engine's running smoothly. It has before, but it still is quite dramatic, isn't it? Away it goes. Mark Garneau was chosen from about 4,000 ap applicants. Remember, we did a interviewed a few of them last year when they were doing the interviews. And the Americans just taken by grace and favor, or are we kicking in some money for it? Well, as you remember, the Canadarm is uh, on board as well, and the Canadian money developed that system. I wonder where that picture was taken from. Here's a map of where they are now, Jake. You can see they're almost over, well, actually, they are over British Columbia now, the northern part of the province. Hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes them 90 minutes to go to circle the Earth once. Now, that's a market of projection, as I recall, and they're now heading from, well, from west to east. east. That's right, yeah. How long does it take them to circle? 90 minutes. While you were on the air, they went around the world once. 
90 minutes really live in space. That's right, yeah. That's coming from the satellite. That's the live picture from uh, the Houston to, Space Center. Are we going to see any interior um, of we the We saw some of them earlier, but they've been coming in and out and um, offering pictures of it. But they were earlier, all seven of them were shown inside the, the bay, and it was very You crowded. know, if, if we did a couple of free programs in NASA, they might give you a free shot to go into space. Do you I feel like you, fancying it? I think you ought to go up. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. A no. walkabout in space. I think it would be perfect. No walkabout in space. <laughs> That's just impossible. Mark Garno, the most famous Canadian now, the only Canadian ever to, to go, go into in, space. He's the second foreigner to go up. What's that? This, these are pictures coming from the shuttle now. This looks like, it's a live picture. It looks like a Sunspot. shot of the Earth. No, it's Is that a shot of the yeah. Earth? That's right. This is Mission Control with Houston. We're now seeing uh, some unscheduled television through the tracking data relay satellite. Uh, we, lost we didn't the see very there, much yeah. of it, no, did we? No, they, they come and go. They're never quite sure when they're going to give us something. Okay, he's away, he's and safe. Yeah. Now, Monday, we've got to tell people, we actually get a day the where day we off. don't have to come into BC TV in Burnaby. Right. And it was left to you to pick out a best of Webster that would be used so that you can be blamed if it's <laughs> oh, not I popular. See. I see, right. This, remember Jeffrey Masson last year in the Assault on Truth? Yes. A remarkable. The guy interview. who said Freud was a phony. That's right. And hated Freud didn't by the, tell us the truth. That's right. And is generally hated by the psychiatric establishment. And so as a couple of nuts, we're interested uh, that's right, yeah. in knowing the truth about <laughs> Freud. We'll have a private session with him after that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Jeffrey Masson was a good book. So right, we're back right. to work on Tuesday. That's right. Tuesday. I don't know what we've got for Tuesday. We probably haven't got anything arranged yet for Tuesday. We may be working Thanksgiving after Mind all. Mind you, that's not your fault. That's no. not my fault. It's Schneider's fault. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him while he's not listening. We're very good at blaming people for <laughs> things that go wrong. Not a bad week this week. It I'll was tell a good you. week. Walter uh, Taylor was very good this morning, and Jim Gretzky didn't do too bad either. <laughs> don't miss the best of Webster with Jeffrey Masson. Thanksgiving, and we'll be back Monday and Tuesday at 9 a.m. precisely. The torso is that of John Dick. The torso is John Dick. A short-lived husband. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so became a major overnight. <laughs> they do think it's safe. And do you think it's safe? I don't know. I'm getting a little long in the tooth to be running off to South America, but you know, I can honestly say I still have the odd dream about it at night time. <laughs> No, no, we weren't married. I just oh. lived with her, for goodness sakes. No, don't go too far. I didn't know the no. Tories lived in sin. Oh, well, it wasn't, uh, it's, I don't think it was, would be called sin. But, this, by uh, my definition, be the one uh, they did. Well, then you're a hypocrite, Jack. <laughs> Well, uh, you know there are too many lefties on council, and not only left, they're so far left you can hardly find them. Did you say he was a wimp? Have you said on this program that Wayne Gretzky is a wimp? You're Jack, the guy that wrote the book a, about it? There is, a, there is a segment of population in this country waiting for Wayne to fall. They would really be delighted if he was found in bed with a sheep. I don't know why, Janet, I never found my color before. Walter Gretzky and Jim Taylor on Check at Midnight. Don't miss Freud was a phony on Monday at 9 a.m. precisely.
interesting political note. Sven.